Chairman. Um, my, my brief today is to talk about left atrial anatomy revisited, but I think um, more of the focus will be on the left atrial appendage. I'm going to speak only a little bit about the general anatomy of the left atrium and then look at the location and shape of the appendage, the os of the appendage, and the relationship of the appendage to important structures and the relationship of the appendage in atrial fibrillation. Okay, we're going to look at then the various components of the left atrium, the appendage, the vestibule being the part leading out to the mitral orifice, the septum, pulmonary venous component. And we also have the os to the appendage and the various pulmonary veins, the right and left pulmonary veins, the right being very near to the plane of the atrial septum. And also we have this structure here, which is the infolding of the left atrium, described as the Q-tip sign by the echocardiographers. And the electrophysiologists term it the left atrial ridge. <clears throat> what does that left atrial appendage look like? And this specimen with the, peri with the fibrous pericardium enclosing the heart, we can't actually see the left atrial appendage very much. Because what we see is this fibrous sac from the outside. And here's the phrenic nerve with its, with its phrenic nerve artery and vein running along that fibrous pericardium. But over here, I have made a cut into, or I haven't yet made a cut, but I've got my forceps into the left atrial appendage and I'm lifting up a little bit of that pericardium. And then I'm cutting in, which is very damaging to the heart specimen and then reflecting away that fibrous pericardium, we can then see the left atrial appendage just peeping out in front of you here. And extending the cut further, <coughs> pulling that peri fibrous pericardium further away, we can see this little gap behind here, the transverse pericardial sinus. In terms of the left atrial appendage direction, it takes all shapes and forms. We have a forward pointing appendage. We've got an appendage here that's pointing into the transverse pericardial sinus, an appendage down here, which seems to be going a little bit backwards instead. Now, what's the relationship between the outside and the inside of the heart then? In this video clip, we have the appendage obviously peeling back and opening into the left atrial chamber. We can already display the mitral valve. I've cut through the inferior leaflet of the mitral valve. So we're looking forwards and we have the right pulmonary veins here and the left pulmonary veins here. The forceps into the os of the left atrial appendage and just sort of waving that appendage around from the inside and here an area which we could describe as the os to the appendage and just picking up a little bit of thrombus that's trapped between the pectinate muscles of that appendage. But over here, we have a chrysantic shape on the top there where my forceps are, the chrysantic shape representing the last part of the fossa ovale to be sealed down. So in this left atrial view, we see a chrysantic shape which is the end of that tunnel of a PFO, so to speak. But right in front of that tunnel then, we are in this part, which is a very thin part of the left atrial wall, sitting immediately after, underneath Batman's bundle. As you can see, very transparent in the tip of the forceps, visible through that thin wall. We can see little pits and dens in, um, representing the floor of that thin wall. And not only that, around the outside of the appendage, we can also encounter from time to time little pits as well. And over here on the outside of the, append of the left atrial wall, that um, great cardiac vein coming around the left atrioventricular groove tissue to join in with the coronary sinus. The endocast images show you the left atrial appendage projecting forwards, the tip of it sometimes covering 
the pulmonary trunk, sometimes not. And then we have a whole host of various shapes of that left atrial appendage, as we see here. Just some examples, one you saw just now, and this one flicking up towards the, the transverse pericardial sinus, and it's got various branches attached to it. Another example, rather stubby looking appendage, this one, but infilling it and showing you some smooth areas and some very rough areas over here. Then another example, really <coughs> stubby little one here, very, very short, uh, several branches, I don't know whether to call them lobes or branches, and coming in to the left atrium. So in terms of the shapes of the appendage, Debeas et al. in JCC um, described them very graphically on their CT imaging. The chicken wing configuration, where there's an obvious bend in the proximal or middle part of the dominant lobe, or a folding back, which they encountered in about 48% of their sample. Then there's the windsock pattern, where there's one dominant lobe with variable number and location of secondary or tertiary lobes, and counted in 19%. About third of what they describe as a cactus pattern, a dominant central lobe with secondary lobes extending from central lobe. Then finally, the cauliflower <coughs> pattern, which they reckoned was only about 3%, limited overall, or overall length, variable number of lobes, or lack of a dominant lobe. So can we have the first question, please, from the system? Question one from the system, please. Okay, which left atrial appendage anatomy is the most challenging for implanting an LNA occlusion device? And can we have the results, please? So the majority would think it's a cauliflower pattern followed by the chicken wing. Thank you. Can we move back to the presentation, please? In terms of branches and twigs or lobes, well, I think if you look at it from the outside, it looks more like lobes, but from the inside, endocast or CT imaging probably look more like branches and twigs. So the second question, please, on, from the system. Question two, please. The most common number of lobes of the left atrial appendage is one, two, three, or four. And the answers, please. So the majority view is that it has uh, two lobes. So can we go back to the presentation, please? Thank you. So Ernst's study in 1995 made 220 endocasts defining branches as those with orifices more than 10 millimeters square and twigs orifices less than 10 millimeters square. Whereas Venus publication using also heart specimens, primarily looking at 500 hearts, defined lobes as each distinct protrusion from the windsock-like body represents a lobe, as does the tail itself. And indeed, the majority, 54%, had two lobes, but importantly, 80% with more than one lobe. In terms of the length of appendage, and this study also looked at male versus female in age, it seems like there's some growth in the length of the appendage, and then that tapers off with older age. And in terms of measuring the echo orifice and an anatomic orifice, there is some sort of distinction. The echo orifice being from the, the ridge area down to the side, whereas the os was more further into the, um, towards the appendage itself. And the study also observed that the os is usually oval rather than round, so they had an ellipsoidal type of shape with long dimensions that increase with age. But the shape is not only oval, occasionally we can find teardrop shaped or even triangular shaped os as well. 
We ourselves conducted some studies on 31 heart specimens looking at diameters, distance to left superior pulmonary vein, the mitral valve, and the left anterior descending coronary artery. And we noted that the distance between the left atrial appendage and left superior pulmonary vein sort of ranged from about 5.8 to 23, so quite a huge range with a mean, val um, mean value of 11.1. The distance between left appendage and mitral valve orifice, a mean of 10.7, but noticeably 4.7 to 14.4 being the range. And distance between the appendage and the LAD was 11.3, ranging again from 5 to 31 millimeters. But the structure that separates the left, left pulmonary veins from the appendage os is that left atrial ridge, as the electrophysiologists call it, or the Q-tip sign for the echocardiographers. As we can see, the width of the left, um, left, left atrial ridge varies tremendously. This one quite flat and wide, giving some distance between the pulmonary venous orifices and the os itself, whereas in this one, there's hardly any distance at all and also the vestibular portion varies. <clears throat> what is within that ridge? Well, importantly, on the outer side of it, we have the Marshall's ligament. On the epicardial aspect, we see the, the artery here and a smaller atrial artery here, and we see the ligament or the remnant of Marshall's ligament over here. The shape and the location of the os can vary as this um, abstract um, study presented in abstract form shows that we can have the os quite high up, quite far from the um, pulmonary venous orifices, or we can have the os quite um, still high up, but then we've got a narrow, narrower left atrial ridge, or the os can be lower down, more, in, more posterior, inferiorly situated. And note already the difference in orientations of that ellipsoidal orifice. This is more circularly arranged. <clears throat> but in the vicinity of the left atrial appendage os, there are always thin areas, pits and troughs, um, which can be very, very thin walled, can be 0.4 to about 1.5 millimeters in thickness, and transillumination really highlights these pits and dents very well indeed. The appendage wall itself, uh, composed of pectinate muscles, of course, and in between the pectinate muscles that can be incredibly thin, hardly any tissue between endocardium and epicardium at all. Now, relationship to coronary arteries, veins, and the phrenic nerve. And this movie just shows us looking down from the atrial side, the left atrial appendage, the tip sort of waving over the top of the pulmonary trunk here, and as we turn around, we can see the great cardiac vein colored in blue and the left um, anterior descending colored up in pink. <clears throat> when we turn the endocast around, uh, the heart around, viewing from the front, again the great cardiac vein coming up here, the left anterior descending and circumflex arteries, and here overlying these structures then, the left atrial appendage. And rotating further around, we can see the os of the left atrial appendage he just here, peeling backwards. There's this little artery, which happens, I think, in this case, to be the artery supplying, um, giving the supply to the sinus node of the heart. The sinus node artery, can t when it comes from the left system, can be coming around to the back of the left atrial appendage, surrounding the back of the neck or the os area, tracking across the top of the left atrial roof, or it can, in, in majority, if coming from the left system, come in front of that left atrial appendage os. And this is an example um, of CT imaging from Dr. Faletra from Lugano showing the retro course of this sinus node artery behind the os of the appendage in fact, running in the region of the left atrial ridge. Also quite important, of course, doing procedures within the appendage or even including the os of the appendage, the left phrenic nerve can, in 23% of individuals um, in our study, pass over the left atrial appendage. The relationship of the left appendage and the atri and atrial fibrillation well, there have been several studies already reporting this. 
um, thrombi located in the left appendage in about 90% of patients with non-rheumatic atrial fibrillation. And the anatomic study showed left atrial appendage remodeling in atrial fibrillation, giving enlarged volumes. And the study of Ernst showed a distinct difference in the volumes of uh, left atrial appendage in patients with AF and in patients um, who were in sinus rhythm. And Shirani's study suggested blood flow status, abnormal co coagulation being the culprits for the formation of thrombi within the appendage. And they also observed it not only increase in volume of the left atrial appendage, but a decrease in volume of the pectinate muscles and marked endocardial fibroelastosis. So in summary then, we have the, not only the appendage to look out for, but also the relationship of the appendage to various other structures. And as this session is just before lunch, whether you're going for chicken wing or cauliflower, whatever, thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.